sometimes when we're first learning about something, an instructor will take us through a period during which it seems we are doing meaningless inane exercises. Most of the time, this is not out of a sadistic desire to waste as much of your time as possible. There's generally a method to the madness. For example, when one is first learning how to ride a bicycle, we do things we would never do once we have learned how to ride a bicycle. Once we have learned how to ride a bicycle, we would not repeatedly roll down a short slope in order to determine how to balance. Nor would we ask somebody to jog alongside us, holding onto the seat to keep us from falling. Once we've learned how to ride a bicycle, these things seem silly. On the other hand, when we're first learning how to ride a bicycle, we generally do not start out with a high-performance bicycle on a steep hill. There is a process to learning how to do something. Ignoring that process can have some pretty poor results. Obviously, this is a setup to prepare us for what might seem like a meaningless exercise. In the last couple of videos, we learned about capacitors and inductors. Because these components have differential current voltage relationships, the response of inductors and capacitors to DC signals is quite simple. When only DC signals are present, the capacitor looks like an open circuit and the inductor looks like a short circuit. Open circuits and short circuits are generally not productive contributors in themselves to a functioning circuit, so why bother? There are actually several reasons. An obvious one in this context is it's a learning tool. Another less obvious one is that very few circuits are entirely DC. DC circuits are constant in time and therefore do not do anything. However, DC analysis may be a good starting point to begin the circuit analysis. A third possibility we can consider is that even a DC circuit has to get turned on or off at least once, and some interesting things can happen between those two states. The on and off states then become boundary conditions to solve the more interesting problem of the transient response. We're going to look at some DC circuits involving capacitors and inductors. Even though that is being stated up front, it is important enough to identify the type of source that is present in circuits that contain capacitors and inductors that the first step will always be to identify the type of source. Sources that are not DC will require completely different analysis techniques. Once we have verified that our circuit contains only DC sources, we can then assert the properties of capacitors and inductors at DC. Let's look at this circuit, and to give us a goal, let's try to determine the energy stored in the capacitor and the inductor. The energy stored in a capacitor is proportional to the square of the voltage across it. The energy stored in an inductor is proportional to the square of the current through it. So we need to determine the voltage across the capacitor and the current through the inductor. The circuit contains one source, and it is the 24 volt DC source. There are no switches in the circuit, so we can assume that it has been like this for a very long time. A very long time for most of these circuits is measured in milliseconds or less. Since the only source is DC, we know the capacitor will act as an open circuit and the inductor will act as a short circuit. If we apply these properties, the circuit only contains one loop. So the current through the resistors will be the inductor current, and also we see the voltage across the capacitor will be the voltage across the 75 ohm resistor. To determine the voltage across the 75 ohm resistor, we could apply voltage division. To do voltage division, we simply take the resistance associated with the voltage we are interested in, divided by the sum of resistors in series with the known voltage, and multiply that by the voltage that is applied to the series combination, resulting in a capacitor voltage of 9 volts. The current can be determined by dividing the 24 volt source by the sum of resistors in series. This results in an inductor current of 0.12 amps. Now that we have determined the capacitor voltage in the inductor current, we can calculate the energy stored in each of the components. Using the capacitor voltage of 9 volts and the equation for the energy stored in a capacitor, we can substitute the values in and determine that the energy stored in the capacitor is 16.2 microjoules. Then using the inductor current, 0.12 amps, along with the equation for the energy stored in an inductor, we can determine that the energy stored in the inductor is 72 microjoules. We can see that circuits that involve capacitors and inductors and only DC sources are relatively straightforward. The inductors behaving as short circuits and the capacitors behaving as open circuits generally simplifies the circuits to a very basic level. Let's try a circuit that looks a little bit messier. Once again, let's determine the energy stored in all of the energy storage devices. 
This one may look a little bit more intimidating because of the number of components and the fact that there are three energy storage devices in it. But when we see that both the sources for the circuit are DC sources, we should know that it is going to simplify at least a little bit. Under DC conditions, the inductors will behave as short circuits and the capacitor will behave as an open circuit. So the redrawn circuit can look like this. Furthermore, we notice that the 20 microhenry inductor, looking like a wire, shorts out the 16 kilo ohm resistor. So the 16 kilo ohm resistor can be ignored. Like we are trying to determine the energy stored in each of the energy storage devices, so let's indicate the quantities we need to determine in order to calculate the energy. We will need to know the current through the 150 microhenry inductor, which is also the current through the 12 kilo ohm resistor. We will need to know the current through the 20 microhenry inductor, which will be the sum of the 2 milliamp source and the current through the 8 kilo ohm resistor. We will also need to know the voltage across the 1 microfarad capacitor. Another simplification we might notice at this point is that because the capacitor became an open circuit, no current will flow through the 1.8 kilo ohm resistor. If there's no current through the resistor, there will be no voltage change across the resistor. The voltage across the 1 microfarad capacitor will also be present across the 3.2 kilo ohm resistor. There are several different analysis techniques we could use to determine all of the parameters. In looking at the circuit, we might notice that one node equation can solve the whole circuit. If we make the bottom node a reference node and define it as 0 volts, then the node above the 15 volt source will be at 15 volts. The remaining node we can call Vx for now. We can then assign directions to the currents that are not already indicated on the diagram. A single node equation at the purple node would have the current through the 8 kilo ohm resistor, the 12 kilo ohm resistor, along with the 2 milliamp source entering the node, while the current through the 3.2 kilo ohm resistor leaves the node. If we multiply through this equation by 96 kilo ohms, we can then simply add the terms and determine that the voltage Vx is equal to 9.84 volts. Given Vx is 9.84 volts, we can determine the current through the 150 microhenry inductor is 0.43 milliamps, the current through the 20 microhenry inductor is 2.645 milliamps, and the voltage across the 1 microfarad capacitor is Vx. We can then use these values to determine the energy in each of the components. The energy in the inductor is 1 half times the inductance times the current through the inductor squared. So for the 150 microhenry inductor, we calculate 13.9 picojoules of energy. For the 20 microhenry inductor, we determine that the energy stored is 70 picojoules. Then, knowing the voltage across the capacitor allows us to determine the energy stored in the capacitor by calculating 1 half times the capacitance times the voltage across the capacitor squared, resulting in an energy of 48.4 microjoules. Since the problem started with parameters that had two significant figures, we should correct the answers to reflect that at the end. That's all there is to it. Once we have verified that a circuit containing energy storage devices has only DC sources, we simplify the circuit and go back to our very basic circuit analysis techniques. When we are analyzing a circuit that contains energy storage devices and resistors, we're going to look at the circuit and determine what types of sources are present. If we see only DC sources, and there are no switches indicated in the circuit, we will remember that inductors look like wires to DC and that capacitors look like open circuits to DC. This of course assumes that we have established what needs to be determined in the circuit. After replacing the inductors with wires and the capacitors with open circuits, we use whichever circuit analysis technique seemed most appropriate to determine the parameters we need to find out. That's all for today. Go out and make it a great one.